I said, do you, do you think there's sexism in the sciences? And she just sort of looked at me as if I was asking, do women have the vote? She was talking about this class as well as her other classes and as well as her, the, the, the math camps she'd been to and so forth. So th that's anecdotal, but fact is, uh, it's at the very, very high end of the ability distribution, if you go to the math camps and the Olympiads and so forth, uh, there are far more males than, than females. And uh, the question is, why should that be? And there are those who will say that um, it has to do with abilities, that male mind, male brains are uh, just constructed uh, better for math and science. Uh, innate abilities uh, at the high end, I mean, the, on average men and women don't differ that much, but at the very high end of the ability distribution, there are many who claim that males have the advantage. I think that um, uh, it, it has to do with preferences and aspirations, is that when it comes to, especially the math-based, the math-driven sciences, physics and um, uh, computer technology, a, as well as engineering, I just think uh, on average women find it less interesting than other fields, including women that have the talent to do it. So I think that, that that's the explanation that I've, I find the most support for. I don't say that there's, there, there, there are arguments to favor the other two, but they're not nearly as compelling, I feel, as this, that men and women are different, particularly in what they find meaningful, interesting, and uh, where they're to, subjects to which they're passionately committed. One I found particularly interesting was a study of uh, parents. This is uh, actually kids who were at a, a science museum in California, and um, the researchers were very clever. Uh, they had uh, audio pickup and, and uh, uh, at, at each of the uh, 12, 15 or so exhibitions, interactive exhibitions, and first they watched what the kids did when they were let loose in the, in the, in the museum, boys and girls, and they were equally involved with these exhibits. And then what they did, the data collection had to do with taping the interaction between the parents, mothers and fathers, and the boys and girls. And these were kids from age one to eight. Uh, when the, the initial analyses showed that the, the kids were equally interested in all the exhibits, there were no gender differences whatsoever. The difference was absolutely striking in terms of the interactions. They coded three different kinds of interactions. The one of particular interest was when the parents uh, gave the children feedback about sort of pre-scientific notions of causality, for example. Uh, to help them understand what they were watching. Boys got more of those kinds of uh, verbal, verbal uh, interactions in, in huge numbers more, like I don't remember the exact, like multiples, eight times as many. It's, and this difference was true from children one year on. So in spite of their interests, the parents were giving the children, not, in that study, you know, uh, helping them to correct their view of things, not just sticking with the description of the exhibit, but helping them to see what's, what's going on and having them have a fluency in scientific concepts. And it's also true that the study after study, a parents encouraging uh, mathematical ability in their sons in a way that they don't in their daughters. And the other thing that's a problem, I think a touchstone for people around innate differences is that once you say something is hardwired, or whatever the, the current language for that is, that men have a hardwired, say, advantage in mathematics, it really sets up a train of thought that's, I think, very regressive and problematic. For example, first of all, there are no data to show that. That's a fact. Second, if you believe that, then why encourage girls to, in, in their own math interests, if they have them, if you don't think that that's going to be congenial to the way their brains are put together? You know, why would you do that if you're a parent? Why would you do that if you're a teacher? So I think the thing is, you, you, and it's not just in math and science, of course, it's a much broader thing. You know, if boys are thought to be less verbal, and girls are thought to, to and, and also, uh, well, let's say verbal, stay with that, and they are slow to start speaking, you're a parent, you say, oh, well, you know, well, that's a boy thing. They'll catch on. Well, not really. The differences are very small. One of the things that we're learning in studies of gender differences is, is not to look just at the difference at the mean, because sometimes you can find that, particularly with large samples, you find a statistically significant difference, which is really irrelevant. The relevant question is, what is the overlap? And in every study that I've seen, and I've just finished reading this, I think, wonderful book by Lisa Elliott called Pink Brain, Blue Brain, which she reviewed hundreds of studies and does report this, this um, effect size statistic, which we're all encouraged to do, but very few people do it. And the effect sizes for most of the diff gender differences are very trivial, yet vanishingly small. So I think the generalizations that about these things have a, a lot of negative re repercussions for teachers, for parents, for, 
for the population. I see the United States Congress, uh, the National Science Foundation, m moving ahead, having adopted a fairly radical mm -hmm. feminist perspective, and they're already looking for ways to impose it um, in the laboratory, in the cl classroom, and I think they're, they're ahead of the science, they're ahead of the discussion. First thing that I find worrisome in all of this is that um, we're expending enormous resources. And NSF has a program called Advance and hundreds of millions of dollars for programs for gender bias workshops. And one woman spent at least part of her grant just creating gender bias bingo. And you can play this game and um, you call up and you, 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 you can apparently win the game by having any number of examples in your life of where you were mistreated and your colleagues or students remember women's mistakes longer than men's and if that's happened to you, you get a bingo. I mean, this is so ridiculous. Uh, and, and this is being uh, funded by, uh, as I said, by NSF at the same moment where we are facing a crisis in boys' education such as we've never seen, that young men on some campuses are um, disappearing entirely. Uh, it's, it, it campuses some of the historically black colleges. Uh, we are looking at a disparity of something that, it, I mean, for some reason, most of the uh, benefits of the civil rights movement seem to have uh, accrued to women rather than the, than the men. Um, it, but it's not only in the African American community. You look at li Latinos in school and the dropout rates. You look at working class boys, colleges like Bloomberg State. Uh, where are the males? And uh, we've lost a lot, I mean, we have a big problem in science. We're attracting too few American children, young people in general. We, I would like to see NSF do a massive outreach, spend all these resources trying to get kids, American young people who want to do science to get them interested. But uh, there is a, a, a huge reading and writing gap uh, that's uh, harmful to boys. There's a college attendance gap that is large and getting larger all the time. I will tell you that a couple of years ago, a commission in California got together, just a sort of objective, curious council of people that wanted to figure out what was going on with the boys in the California system and found that f entire schools that had once been dominated by got males and hardly any females, it had been reversed. And so they were looking at their not only their, their veterinary program, but schools of dentistry and optometry. And they saw the law school was going uh, to more uh, favoring females. And they, they then began to wonder, what, what is this going to mean in the long run? So, so few boys attending college at all, and then uh, disappearing from all but disappearing. It's a bit of an overstatement, but sustainable any, anyway uh, in uh, uh, many fields. And so we find this. And, and, the, and the answer is, uh, and I'll end with this, the advocacy gap, which is that women have at least uh, just dozens, I would say more than hundreds and hundreds of organizations uh, looking out for their rights uh, and making sure that there's parity. You have groups ranging from the, you know, uh, the Association of, uh, the American Association of University Women and the National Women's Law Center and all the women's studies programs. And there, there's a group called the National Council for Research on Women. It's 112 groups uh, sort of marching in sisterly solidarity, creating scholarship anytime anything's amiss for women. Even if it's something very arcane, there are more, there are more men than women in the physics department at Stanford. They'll have a study, a program, a solution, and the government uh, reaction. Boys, there's nothing. Zero. There aren't these organizations. Now, am I saying, well, I want to have a national organization for boys and, uh, you know, women? No, I don't. But I wish these women's groups would cease and desist. And I wish they would stop p promoting these faux crises. Do we have a problem with women in science? I mean, possibly in some departments, some places. If you read, I think the more responsible literature you find, it l has largely to do with preferences, as I said in the beginning, what, men, what interests men and women. There's not a lot of evidence that if a young woman really wants to do science, she's held back, but we can differ on that. But with boys, there's a huge problem at all levels of education that is ignored because of these, this very serious gap, and I wish there'd be some attention to the needs of, of young men.